Uh, so yeah, thank you so much one more time. So yeah, so uh, I am reading uh, this book. <laughs> I'm not done. Yet. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm not there done. Yet. Yeah, I am not done yet. But you know, while I'm reading, I'm just like, you know, I I'm yeah, I'm like, okay, I, 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 you know, I really want to, I always want to understand everything. <laughs> so that's why I'm like, I, I'm going to reach out and, and ask some follow-up questions. So I am specifically, you know, on a page 171. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so in your, in your matrix that you actually have behind you, mm -hmm. you have this first column that calls select and train. Yes. So my question is about, you know, the difference between the selection process and the training process, because I'm not sure if I understand and I'm I'm thinking, is it about uh, picking the means of learning uh, that you have four of them or? Yeah. Well, so the what the what the selection versus training. the So we're we're in a knowledge and skill category. It could mm -hmm. be. Yes. Uh, regulations, uh, laws, regulations, and codes. It could be tools and equipment. It could be many different things. And so we've, what we've done is we've done kind of a focused brainstorming, looking at outputs and tasks, mm -hmm. and then a particular category and say, what do you need to know about in order to be yep. able to uh, perform effectively, to you know, perform tasks to produce outputs. And so we generate a list and then we go and and while we're generating that list we can link to the area of performance you know what area of performance did this come from if i use the addy model is this knowledge and skill for analysis or design or development or implementation or evaluation uh, more than one all of them and and so you get that data there so I do those first sets of columns yes. for all of the knowledge and skill yes. categories. And then we go back to the very first page of knowledge and skills. This is part of my redundancy by design yes. effort. So I want the master performers and other subject matter experts that I'm working with, usually in a group forum, in a group process. Um, and then and then so I we revisit the list. And we re revisit the linkages because somebody is likely to say, you know, we we missed a, a check mark here or whatever, or we missed yeah. an item, and and so this gives us a chance to go back and recover from whatever might have been missing. But then we get to the these extra columns at the end, yeah. the select train. So so my question to the group is: on this very first knowledge and skill item. Do we select for this in recruiting and selection? And no kidding, no one ever gets the job unless they have that. Now that could have been adding and subtraction or you know, writing, communication. So is this a requirement of the selection system? So that means there's no training implication. Selection and recruit, recruiting and selection is gonna take care of this. They're gonna give us people who already know these things. What we've listed are knowledge and skills that you need to be able to do the job, but we hire some people who already know that. Got um, it. And so therefore, there's no training implication. And we can show that to the clients later on that's saying, yes, here's the knowledge and skill, but recruiting and selection takes care of this all Got of the it. time, 100% of the time. That's guy's challenge to the group. And I'm and so I would challenge him and say, you mean I can't get that job if I have every other knowledge and skill requirement and I don't have this one and you're not going to give me the job. And then there's some hemming and hawing and they may go, well, you know, yeah, yeah, we probably would hire you. And then we, so there is a training implication, you know, and that's what I'm trying to screen for. I'm trying to eliminate those knowledge and skills that are required for the job but are attended to by the organization through recruiting and selection and don't have to be addressed with training. Now, people can come in onto the job, have that knowledge and skill when they come in and learn even more. Um, yep. But but so that's the point. I'm trying to Got eliminate training people. Gary Rumler said this on a video in 1981 at Motorola. You know, we send people to three days of training and they come out knowing what they knew when they went in. You know, and so that's a ridiculous waste of shareholder equity. And so therefore, selection and training is trying to winnow down, narrow our list to the things that we truly have to attend to. And 
I don't want to limit people's generation of the knowledge and skill items by saying we only want to deal with the critical ones or we only want to deal, you know, that comes later. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll, I want them to say, here's what you need to know in order to be able to perform. Got it. And so that's, that's the, that's the uh, intent of that because the master performers and, and other subject matter experts that I'm working with, they look at that list when we're done and they go, are you going to tra develop training on all of that? I mean, that's yeah. ridiculous. How stupid. I don't want to be a part of this process. So this lets me help them narrow down the things that they know are critical. Now, just because they know it doesn't make them absolutely right. But, you know, who else are yeah. you going to ask other than master performers and other subject matter experts who. Uh, and, and so that's the nature of, of selection and training. It is to really say, here's the things that training or learning needs to attend to potentially because it may be low yeah. priority low and there, therefore we won't we'll leave it to informal learning but we're just trying to narrow down the vast because usually i mean i've worked on some of the projects where there were 1800 knowledge and skill items that i you know in a if we were bringing people into the job that knew absolutely nothing they would need to know yeah. all night 1800 items I mean, that's so I have a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. um, so specifically because I'm I'm working with a software, you know, software companies that have innovative innovative product, and in a lot of cases, you know, they are building the product that pretty much shows their point of view on the market. So it's kind of like a new approach. So with that perspective someone yes has you know has all this knowledge but you want to understand if you have a shared knowledge so i understand that you are what you're getting that okay i want to hire someone that has its, its competencies and uh, you don't want to kind of retrain them but at the same time how to deal with the situation that okay i do have you know person who is very knowledgeable but however there might be i want to make sure that they have they with this they, right now they have the same point of view as us because previously they might be you know they might be knowledgeable but it was a different approach so yeah so that's so there's the difference between knowledge and skills and performance our performance models and that data says what people have to do. And it also shares if they're, if it's a team effort, you know, you and I with different job titles, you know, you no. could be the technical expert. I could be the financial expert on the team. And we both need to understand some things similarly. We have to have yeah. a shared knowledge, no. shared understanding, sh a shared perspective on certain things. Um, but, th but that's in performance. But so what knowledge and skill enables that performance and that shared understanding? Now, I may get hired with it and you may not. You, I may understand, you know, cost benefit analysis and, and you may not exactly. And so therefore you need it. I need it, but I already have it. So, but for example, so let's, let's maybe in a context of an ablement. So for example, uh, we want to hire an ablement person and uh, we will get someone that it's, you know, okay, they are knowledgeable about an ablement, but obviously, for example, they don't, they don't follow your processes. So then that person is knowledgeable, but at the same time, because they do, they know a lot, but at the same time, you know, there is like a new approach that you want yeah. them to, so, so then do you, process. So then so you retrain them pretty yeah, much. Yeah, you would have okay. they would you yeah. don't have to teach them about enablement, what that's all about. Yeah. You just need to teach them here's our process for that. That's what they don't know. They understand the core, if you the will, core. or okay. the general knowledge of enablement, but they don't know how to apply it. They knew how to apply it in their last company, but they don't understand your specific processes. And this is this Got is it. critical. We need uh, we need our people to understand our processes, processes and how their knowledge and skills fit into it. Got and, it. And maybe there's things that you needed to know and do in your last company's process that we don't do here. Some other job does it, or we don't think it's necessary. Whatever those differences might be. 
Got it. Okay, perfect. So I I know everything right now. Thank you so much for that explanation. I mean, not everything, but I, right. uh, but yeah, I I you're, I, oh, you're I on the road. Yeah, right. I understand what what's the difference. So uh, my next question was about the last column. Uh, so it's about the depth uh, and whether the specific uh, uh, skill knowledge and skills require uh, whether awareness, knowledge, or skill set. So here I have very, you know, I would like to understand the difference. Uh, uh, I mean, I know that I know in general what's the difference between the three sure. of them, but how to actually apply them. And I will give you a specific example here. So uh, currently I'm working for the company that has sales, very, very technical, technical products. So we have salespeople, uh, but on the each customer call, they always have a sales engineers. So there is a different, so for example, they need to know about a certain feature. Yeah. So the salesperson definitely needs to be aware about that feature. Probably some, some, yeah. So then I'm need to, so then my next step, I need to decide like how much they actually need to know about this knowledge because then, then there is a, 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 a solution engineer that pretty much, you know, then whenever salesperson knowledge ends, the solution yeah. engineer knowledge starts or maybe not starts, but so, yeah, in that well, sense, I'm trying to like how to, yeah, how to dig dig deeper into the depth. So, uh, to, well, so to, I, I've dealt with uh, uh, salespeople with their engineer, the sales engineer, what they would call them maybe back in the 90s. And of course, the sales engineer who was the technical expert hated when the salesperson tried to answer a question because they would answer it wrong. They wouldn't have it perfectly right. And the salesperson would be mad at the sales engineer because they would go into great detail when the salesperson didn't think it was necessary. Uh, but that's the, that's the, yeah. so, that's... so it used to be when I started off with this, there was only a K and an S. I mm -hmm. wanted to know, on that knowledge and skill item, did the training need to go just to the knowledge level? People needed to know this, and if they could pass a test, a quiz, yeah. that would be fine. Or was there a skill? Apply so if you said spreadsheets, I need to know a lot about spreadsheets. I've never put one together, but I can answer yeah. a lot of questions. You know, so I need them to know to be able to create a spreadsheet. Okay, so that's different than knowing about it is being able to create a spreadsheet now. What's that spreadsheet used for? That's the performance side of that. But but so we need to teach people about spreadsheets. And I, you know, my question basically is, do they need to have just a knowledge or do we have to take them to skill? Yep. And because skills require more time. And this question is a trap yep. for later on in the design phase. When people tell me, oh, yeah, we can do two, three minutes on that. I go, but it requires a skill. Yeah. You guys said that skills is, yeah. in the last meeting. And now you're saying, oh, we don't need very much. Explain that to me, because maybe they're right. But I need to understand the differences, why we said this earlier and why we're saying this now. But so the so the the depth is the depth of the instruction or training or learning and how far does Lotta my do. master performers and other subject matter experts think it needs to go in a learning context, in a training Lotta context? Do. And so this, so back in 1990, I was doing work with Illinois Bell in mm -hmm. the Chicago suburbs. And I was dealing with data technicians because, you know, data was becoming a big thing back then. And these were the people that were installing the data systems. So it wasn't just voice over yep. these lines it was data over these over the telephone lines and when we got to the design uh so i got when i got to this here uh the, that column they stopped and they wouldn't answer my question with knowledge or skill yeah and they and i and we we had a stalemate in my meeting and i wanted them to say you know tell me knowledge or skill what's and they go no they had decided they were afraid, and they told me this in the meeting eventually, that they were afraid if they put down a K, that they would get a two-hour module on that when they only needed five minutes because their training organization would for sure create a two-hour module and they didn't want to be any part of that. 
Yeah. And these are, this is the voice of the customers, the voice yep. of the master performers, the voice of the target audience screaming at you. Training does overkill in the extreme yep. all too often. When we need five minutes on something, they're going to give us two hours. When we need two hours, they're going to give us a full day. They see that. And they were resisting in my meeting. And so I, so I on the spot said, well, how about instead of putting a K down, we just put awareness, which means I just need to have a general awareness of this. I don't, don't need deep knowledge. Yeah. I just need a skill. And so that's where the A versus K portion of this came from. So it is a signal from the voice of the customer, the voice of the master performers, that we need just a little bit on this. Now, what does that mean? A little, yeah. you know, a little on one knowledge, uh, awareness on one uh, a knowledge and skill item can be different than awareness on a different one. And in your case with the sales people versus the sales engineer, the, the solutions engineer, um, you know, that's that's the interplay. We don't expect salespeople to know in depth technically how the, the tool or system works. They need yeah, to yeah, yeah, features yeah. and benefits. They don't need to be able to explain to the engineer on the customer side in great detail and draw diagrams on a piece of paper to explain things. Yeah. We, sale, we, so we expect the solution engineer to be able to do that, to talk at that level of depth. Um, and we say we might say that they don't need a skill because we've hired them with the skills. They just need to have the knowledge on this. So if we tell the solution engineer and give them the knowledge, we know that they will be able to demonstrate a skill because yeah. of you know their prior knowledge, their incoming knowledge. Um, but so there's there's no hard fast line between awareness and knowledge. All awareness is is just a little bit of knowledge, knowledge not yeah, a lot, yeah. not great depth, not deep knowledge, but shallow knowledge. And, and of course, okay. I got burned the first time I ever used the phrase shallow knowledge. So <laughs> I typically avoid that. Okay. But it's, um, and do you have any other materials about, you know, uh, you know, if I have some specific piece of knowledge, like how to decide what should be on under awareness and like where's you know where and uh, awareness it? and when so, you know so this is how when I train people on this now I I I was a journalist in the United States Navy and I graduated with a degree in radio TV film from the journalism school of the University of Kansas and what we learn as journalists for print journalism is that the very first paragraph of a news story explains the who, where, what, why, when, and how. The first paragraph. The second paragraph goes into more about who. The third paragraph goes into more about what. And so you go into greater right. detail. So the equivalent here is that if you need awareness, you need to know the who, where, what, why, when, and how. And that's sufficient. You don't need any more depth, but others would. So if you had something that you needed to train three different levels of audience, the yep. practitioner who's going to do something, their manager, and their vice president. The vice president needs the awareness level. Yep. The manager needs the knowledge, knowledge level. level. Yeah, the practitioner exactly. needs the skill level. level. They need to actually be able to do it. The managers need to know what, what, how do you can tell good from bad and his guy doing the job adequately. And the vice president needs to be aware of what we're doing here so yeah. they don't come around and go, hey, what are you doing? Don't do that. Stop. <laughs> do something. You know, we. So, so we're really trying to just simply separate and see, do we have multiple audiences? Yep. Do they need the very same thing? I mean, if we're going to teach creating spreadsheets, yeah, all three levels need to be able to ha exhibit yep. skill on creating spreadsheets. What they do with it, of course, would be different at those three different levels of positions. But but so that that's the explanation. Now I did, I've written a blog post about this. Uh, I went and looked for this after our conversation and now I will put it in the show notes when we post the video on this. Um, and I'm looking for it here and I don't have it right in front of me. I don't know what I did with it. But um, so I explained this little Illinois Bell story of how this came to be. But this is, I, I would, I, it's not an exact thing so it's just you know general awareness versus deeper knowledge versus having yeah. a skill and okay. that's it okay 
perfect. Thank you so much for that. So I have another question. My next question is about uh, the specific uh, knowledge and skills categories. And I actually created a small visual. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I'm very, very visual person. Uh, so if you, I want to share it because I just want to, uh, in a, because I just want to confirm in my, if, if my understanding is correct. So, sure. uh, yeah. Uh, can you see my screen? Yep. I can, I can. And that's exactly it. Those are my 17. You know, yeah. This is the 17, 17 categories and they right. are goes here. So right. is my understanding correct that. You know, if we talk about environmental uh, assets management systems, these are pretty much uh, the seven that you list in your in your articles. <clears throat> so, and my understanding is correct that they go here as like literal assets, but they goes here as knowledge and knowledge and knowledge and skills, and then that is tied to the human. <laughs> human asset management system specifically training development yep. and that's how this okay so so wait a minute so you need to highlight staffing and uh, the yeah. recruiting and selection systems because sometimes i mean yep. if we were smart we would try to hire in everything we need and then oh, yeah, deal yeah, with yeah, what yeah. we didn't get and then we would need to train you know uh educate yep. and train people on certain things so the the even the job job and organization design, I might say, well, what if yeah, I'm that's pretty do yeah, that, spreadsheets, yeah. why don't yeah. I put that in one job? Why don't I put all the spreadsheet stuff in one job and eliminate it from the other jobs? I, maybe that makes sense, maybe it doesn't. So, but yeah, 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 I, I, yeah, I, I, I was even actually thinking, you know, to uh, not to outline in, in pink because I think all of them kind of tie to that, but I just put the training and development yeah, in, you know, but you're right, uh, that's what know. training and development deals with the knowledge and skills. We are there to help people if they didn't hire in with it, if yeah. it wasn't part of their prior knowledge, their incoming knowledge and skills, then training you know, through the supervisor doing it, you know, one-on-one -on -one, or a peer doing it one-on-one, -on -one, or we invite the L&D organization to come in and build us some content yeah. to help that, you know, one way or another, we need to get that done. And so the knowledge and skills, your your arrow there is, is true. Those are my 17 categories that evolved from initial eight, I think is what I was using back in the 1981-82. And then it evolved to, to these 17 um but yeah that's the connection yeah so that's the pretty much the connection yes that's what um uh, so because they have like for that the reason why i'm asking because here you have tools equipment machinery so it's also here so that's yes. why i just wanna like okay so this this is literally making sure that we have those tools and this is we need to train them how to use those yeah tools. if yeah. It, we were if it was a lights out factory yeah. All the environment would be there. Yeah. Now we now if we had robots, you know, doing pre yeah. preventive maintenance on, on robots, then then there's no humans. But if there's a human, this is what they need. So I need knowledge and skills to manipulate yeah. my environment. I need perhaps physical attributes. Maybe I have to pick up heavy equipment. Maybe, you know, so it, it, maybe it. I have to have stamina because sometimes I've got to do a, a 14 hour shift. And so I need those physical attributes, you know, and so so the human enters the process performance party yeah. and they bring something to that. To that. And yeah. what is it they need to bring to that because the environment. So there's a lot of tools and equipment that are in the background that the performer doesn't know anything about. But it just yep. happens. It's automated. We've automated part of our processes and the human may know that there's machinery or software and, and and hardware that's doing things and they don't know the ins and out of it they just know that's what they use and i can drive a car without understanding you know how how it actually really works but but so i have so it's the marrying of the knowledge and skills to all of how to use the data how to use the materials and supplies how to use the equipment you know no, it, got it etc perfect um so I have a few more questions because this sure. is pretty much uh, answer my core three questions, but I have a few follow up questions if you uh, if you if you don't mind. So Let's go for it. Uh, 
In context of these uh, knowledge categories, uh, I know that in your book you are saying to reuse as much content as it's, as possible. Uh, I am currently working in the environment that there is no content, <laughs> so uh, because again it's a startup, so it's you know it's it's right. building things from scratch. Um, do you have any? additional resources or recommendation or, or if that's even something that when it comes to actually developing that con because uh, uh, it's different than developing instructions uh, yes because then this knowledge is an input to the to the instruction but did have you in your efforts also have been developing if the, if it's not existent or it needs to be developed because you know it's just you know it's just not it, it it's it's not uh, you cannot reuse it so uh is that something that you have been doing or there was another person working with you and so that's one question and second do you have any um any you know additional materials or, or or you know processes how to guide a person on creating this content because obviously that requires an expert so yeah so uh, yeah so that so without getting hung up in the the technology tools to create yeah. content yeah there's so this goes back for me to design i'm mm -hmm. trying to th th this analysis data informs design yeah but there's in design there's concepts that I use to help increase reuse. Uh, a systems engineer would design the components of the system knowing that they may need to uh, exchange. It's like the, the in, in the old days here, car radios. You could get an AM radio. You could get an AM FM radio. You could get yep. an AM F radio with a cassette player. It was the, there was a hole in the dash for reuse of radios. And, and and so when we design, we have to think, what are the variables that are going to change? And how do I minimize my life cycle costs? How do I reduce my life cycle costs by my design today? Yeah. So if I design things and I know that there's a A and a B and a C, and that the C is volatile, technology is always changing, we're always updating C, but A and B have been good since the days of Socrates. So there, that's stable. So how I design and intermingle that content, I'm trying to design and then develop content, instructional content, so that I reduce the maintenance costs yep. to keep it up to date. And so there are ways to just think about how I segregate content and how I intermingle content in such a way that when it's time to change and update C, that I can do that without I increasing yep. my costs. So, yep. so that's the idea. Uh, I remember my clients at General Motors back in the '90s were telling me that when they first came out with all this electronic, digital computer stuff in cars, yep. that those computer hardware and software modules went under the driver's seat because there was no room behind the dash. So. All the wiring harnesses had to go back under the driver's seat because that was the only room that they had to put these modules because behind the dash was filled with components. And so, you know, this caught them unaware. So in the future, you know, the future designs for cars anticipated the need for different functionality, the different for a different modules, com uh, components behind the dash. Um and of course, then miniaturization of electronics and all of those kinds of things, you know, helped with you know managing space. So, but but that was that was my that's the intent. And so yeah. I have written about that. You should see some of that in that book. There's the lesson mapping book okay. uh, yeah, that I gets was... into that. Okay. Um, but I I don't know that I I I've spoken about this. Um, I've, I'm sure I've written about this, but I don't know where it is in depth. Um, I, I don't know. Does that help? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, de definitely. Uh, but but yeah, but like, it, but it, yeah, you, but in general, yes. I'm as I said, like I, we need to create a lot of content from scratch. Like for yeah. example, you know, market knowledge, product knowledge. Yep. And then, uh, so and obviously, you know, 
I am not an expert, so I cannot create them. But at the same time, I want to guide others. So they are not, I mean, again, it, it, it's actually probably also going back to the depth. This will go into direct the depth on the content because, uh, okay, we decided that this is just an awareness. So for, for this audience with this specific, just create the document. And then when it comes to the knowledge, uh yeah so pretty much i think that's what going to you know going to guide specific um yeah specific content development uh yeah the the, level. The, i mean the content that you're developing so if you said uh if we put an s in that column for depth that means worst case is we need a skill but does yep. the vice president need a skill so if we created our content from the very beginning, if our standard practice was the very intro is high level awareness, and yeah. then we take the learner, if they need to go beyond awareness to knowledge, we build on top of the awareness. So yeah. we've created the awareness piece once and used it for awareness training, knowledge training, and skills training for our three different audiences. They get the very same thing. Yeah, now, and a, a content management system, much yeah. as the media companies use, uh, they would have created, you know, a set of content. They would have put it on the radio, on television, in the yeah. newspaper, and in a magazine. Same content. They're they're sharing that co that content object. I don't like the term object, but but they are sharing that and using that. Well, when I design things, I start off with we got to create a, a basic awareness. Then yeah. we're going to layer in knowledge on top of that. And then if, when we need, if we need to, we're going to take that knowledge the and, knowledge and, 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 and make turn it, it into. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think I, uh, okay. I think I have my answer. And then I have a, a, a not related to that questions. <laughs> I mean, everything is reconnected. Yeah. But, uh, uh, so my first question is about the standards. So uh, in your, um, do you have any more, any more examples of, or, you know, or written an article specifically about the standards? Because I understand the definition. So here it's what's the standard of a range per measure metrics, but I do need to set a lot of standards. So uh yeah, the, so you need to uncover what those standards are yeah. unless you're creating those processes. So, you know, I always uh, uh, defaulted to what I learned from the total quality management movement yep. about measures, you know, quality, quantity, yeah. and cost, yeah. uh, or better, faster, and cheaper. Um, and the standards are, you know, you either just design the standards because we've got 10 people doing it and two people can operate at 95% efficiency or effectiveness yeah. and we, and everybody else is at 60. So the standard might be 90, 90, 95, whatever the yeah. number is, yeah. we're trying to get people to that. We may have people that perform beyond the standard and that shows us that going beyond the standard is possible. So why isn't that the standard? You know, why can't we get everybody yeah. else to be like that? Well, maybe it's, you know, uh, a, a, a tricky combination such as in baseball or any sport, yeah. you know, um, knowing things and having certain skills is not necessarily going to make you a superstar. That's different. But um, yeah, so creating standards for processes are about how we measure performance and what i learned is we measure the what what tom gilbert called accomplishments what his business partner in the 70s my mentor gary rumler called uh, outputs and so we can measure the output you know if you're a script writer you produce scripts well how yeah, many so are then, you supposed to do a week a month a year you know yeah, and, and then so the, so okay and then when it comes to qual then when it comes to quality then you can have, for example, you know, um, one, two, three as a scale. So but this yeah, is you could say customer acceptance. How many times does the customer tell you to go back and redo it? And so how many revisions might be the quality measure? Guy gets his done and guy takes five versions, revisions to get his done. And Kaya gets it done in three. 
Okay. And how so about, so for example, uh, you know, when the salesperson is on the call, uh, they need to get specific information from the customer to confirm that they can help them. Yeah. So they are they are asking a question and then they get an answer. So then I get, so for example, and then they got the answer and then, you know, the answer could be sufficient uh, uh, from the from the very you know uh, on the first you know the first question, but then they need to know what it's not sufficient answer. So then I would just yes. show them, okay, this is th this is the answer that you need to get, and this is not sufficient answer. So then to show them, so then they know, okay, I didn't get a sufficient answer, and I need to ask follow up question. In exactly. that's pretty much so. So I would have said, you know, you the the you ask a question to get the answer, answer, yeah, not a answer, and yeah, the any answer, old yeah. answer is not good. So my question yeah. to the group would have been, how can you tell a good answer from a bad one? What are the earmarks? What are the um, uh, I'm not sure what word to use here, but uh, how can again, how can I tell a good answer from a bad one? Well, it talks yeah. about this, and so it's gotta it's gotta include yeah. maybe three or four things to it. Yeah. Okay. And maybe by design, you're asking a question to get the first answer so that you can ask more questions about that. So in the spin selling model, you ask yeah. situation questions to uncover problems yeah. and opportunities so that you can figure out the implications, big deal or no big deal. And yeah. so you can figure out here's what needs are to be paid off. So there's a Socratic yeah, set yeah, yeah, of questions, yes, yes, yes. right? Yeah, it, yeah, but it's and those are yeah. So this is yeah in spin model, but also in also in the sales process in general because you need to know how they buy. You know who is so yeah. it's. But I, I was just so yeah. So yet yeah, all those answers are those answers are input somewhere else. So yeah, yeah exactly. so, so definitely. Okay, great. So uh, even so, so part of it is is that answer adequate to get to the next question? Yes. Yeah. To get and to if the, it's not, you have to stay to, there. Yeah. You can't move on from yeah. in the spin model. Yeah. To the P, unless you've got the Just situation, situation. Yep. nailed Please, down. Um, and so how do yep. you, you know, so that's the question. And and th this is where it's tricky because if I usually uh, uh, do this work with a, with, in a team group forum with yep. master performers and they might, and I say, you know, how can you tell a good answer from a bad one? And they might tell me now, just because they told me that doesn't make them perfectly right doesn't even make them no. actually right right because they could all be wrong but but it's a starting point for me and the acid test the true test as to whether i got it right from them and then created content and deployed it is whether or not people can take that learning and perform on the job that's the acid yep. test as to whether or not the yep. whole chain of of what we in l and d do is successful is whether or not the learner can perform back out on the job. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much for confirming that. So I have one more, uh, one more question, or maybe two, if we still have a time. Uh, so uh, again, I'm working in an environment right now when I'm pretty much uh, setting up everything from scratch. Um, and definitely there are uh, deficiencies in the process itself. So it's either not defined or need to be adjusted. So before moving into the design, should I fix the process first? Um, and then also, that, so that's in my, so that's in my, you know, but in general, like once you, that's you a, know. Yeah, that's a business decision. That's your client's decision, decision as to whether or not you and or somebody else should fix the process yeah. or there's no time for that. That's going to take too long or we don't have the funding for that. We're going to have to live with a faulty process and do the best we can with it. Now, when you look at uh, uh, successful master performers or top performers, if they can perform with a faulty process, that means there's workarounds. We need to figure out how they are doing those workarounds and teach everybody else how to do those workarounds because we've got a faulty process and it's scheduled to be fixed three quarters from now, but we've got people who need to do this today. And so therefore that's a business decision as to whether you fix the process first or not. A lot of my clients and, and the target audience that they had me work on, they didn't own those processes. 
they could complain all they wanted to. They could they could clamor and ask that they get those processes be fixed, but they couldn't be. So we had to live with what we had, a faulty process, and do the best that we can. And then we would look at our exemplars, our top performers, and see, well, how are they doing this? And and if they're not breaking the law or breaking a company policy and procedure, we ought to train everybody else to be just like them because they know how to navigate they got a, it. a faulty process. And when we're dealing with the process owners now in a brand new startup, you know, who's the process owner and, and who's responsible for this? Well, that's their call. There may be a reason why some of our processes are deemed to be faulty when actually what they're doing is complying with the laws, regulations, and codes or customer requirements. Yeah. And therefore, it's a clunky process, but there's nothing we can do about yeah. it. The government forces us yeah. to do it this way. Got it. So, uh, but that but that's what's tricky. So the whether a process is truly faulty, you really need to do systems thinking and back yeah. way up and say, what are all the variables? What are all the stakeholders? Why is this process this way? Does it have to be? Can we change it? And what's the cost to change it? If you told me it's going to cost you $10 million to change that process. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. yeah. That's, 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 the co- that's the cost of conformance. But what's the cost of nonconformance? If you said it's $100 every quarter, we should live with that process because it's too costly to fix it. We need to just live Got with it. it. Got it. And the same goes with the deficiencies in the environment. Yes. So some of yeah. them, yeah, some of them, you know, maybe it will be easy to fix, but if we there's nothing we can do, we just need to live with it and just see what the master performance are doing right now. Yeah, and, and we take this back yeah. to the client and the stakeholders because yeah. they own this. Yeah. We're doing this for them. We in learning and development, we don't own anything. We're here to support them and they get to make the decision. So I Got had a, an incident uh, back in the 90s where we're, a, 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 a team, I wrote an article about empowerment about this. Yep. A team was empowered to fix something. They came back with a plan. They had done all the studies. They had the ROI calculated, all this good stuff. Management ignored it. And then the team got upset. They had worked really hard. They, and they had done all the things right. They had presented the management yep. and management did not sign off on what they were suggesting. What that team didn't know and what management couldn't share is they were going to sell that part of the business off it soon, and they weren't going to spend a nickel on it. And so good work by the team, but they couldn't share that they were going to sell that part of the business off because that would give the competitors an advantage. And so everybody was quiet. Now, the team, there were people on the team that were very upset and started sabotaging work because they were upset because they thought they had been empowered. And they were empowered within a limit, but but so part of what we need to understand is there are things that are that we won't understand because they are company secrets, they're enterprise secrets that have major implications to our position in the marketplace, our stock price, or whatever. There's things that that executives, the planners, won't tell the people doing the work because there's secrets coming, and. And so we in learning need to be appreciative of the fact that we're not always going to have all the data, all the insight that we need. We just have to do the best that we can. And management might be willing to have some people upset because we're going to sell this business off and we're going to displace it with our new technology. We're going to blow the market away. It's worth billions or trillions. And so therefore, we're going to have to... uh, we're going to have to be acceptable of a situation that's not ideal. It's going to just yeah. have to be real. Okay. So I have I have one more question, if I can okay. squeeze it. Uh, yeah. So as as I already mentioned at the beginning, that what wasn't recorded, how I got into an ablement because uh, with you know I have been working with at this point I think like more than 150 companies and I did uh, and then I it identified the knowledge gap of not understanding their customers as a you know pretty much across the board mm-hmm. uh but then as I said then I got in uh yeah so I started to learn more about an element and <laughs> you know everything what we discuss it's it's not only that what it's broken there is a lot of you know a lot of things uh a lot of other things that it's broken but um, but then in your book, you are saying that about the requirements, 
for the performance. You said that while customers might lead the definition of requirements, they don't have the final final sale. Say, yeah. not sales, final say. So I totally agree with you know, I agree with you because that's the that's the example uh, I think to what I just what I discovered. So the customers, you know, you don't understand the customers. So then when you are on the sales call, you don't know if you can help them because the customers have specific requirements that you cannot, you are not able to, you know, to um, to evaluate when you are on the sales call. And then, and then, uh, and then, and then, as you said, like while customers might lead the definition of requirements, they don't have the final sale. They don't have this final sale because then no one cares in inside the company to actually, you know, treat those requirements uh, serious. If if that's if if that's the correct thinking here, uh, well, or- so. So the customer has requirements for their processes and in order no. to meet their stakeholders no. requirements, et cetera, et cetera. So, but if your customer requires you to do things that break the law, no. the customer is not king. They don't have the final say. The government will fine your company, throw yeah. your executives in jail. And so, so there's a, that's a different article I wrote for the quality journal back in the nineties was that there's this hierarchy of stakeholders. Yeah. And yeah, while yeah, the yeah. customer may lead and say, we want this, maybe in America it's okay, but you can't sell that in Canada and in Europe and in Asia. And you got to decide, you know, do I meet that customer requirements or do I have two different products? You need to understand the stakeholders' requirements. And and while if you don't meet the customer's requirements, you could lose that business, but if there's a if the customer requirements requires violating the law, none of your competitors could or should be meeting that requirement anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what you need to do is you need to so your you and your competitors, you with your competitors, you're either at parity with your competitors, you're just like them. You have an advantage over your competitors, yeah. or you have a disadvantage compared to your competitors. You want to at least be at parity. You want to meet the customer's needs as much yes, as you can yes. without breaking the law because your competitors are going to do that too. So maybe you find some other way to meet the customers, not their needs, but their desires, not their needs, but their wants. You know, this is one of the things that sales folks used to talk about back in the 80s is that, you know, customers have needs and they have wants. If you simply yeah, yeah. meet their needs and the competitor is meeting their needs and their wants, they win. And so you need to understand both and under, but but just because the customer wants something or demands yeah. something, you know, we need to keep in, you know, if the if the executives say, hey, if you meet that customer's requirements, you're going to bankrupt our custom our company. Well, then we're not going to meet that requirement. So yep. people in the learning space need to understand just because there's a customer requirement. That's not the end of it. That's not what we have to do. We have to look at this as a systems thinker and think about the broader system, which includes all these stakeholders, yeah. all these competitors, us, our customer, et cetera. Okay. I was more I was also more talking from the context of the marketplace knowledge. And then the, you know, um, I don't know okay. how to um that. Yeah, again, because I do believe there is a big knowledge gap in general in that specific uh, specific industry. I'm not saying about other industries that might be different, but so I'm trying to like, but at the same time, you know, I know at the same time, I know that that in those companies that the whole enablement, you know, the whole enablement environment is just broken. So it's, I mean, and along that, of course, that key component that it's, you know, that it's customer knowledge. Um, so that's why I'm trying to like, so I'm trying to like prioritize if it's, you know, which, um, I'm not sure what I'm asking the right question, but I don't know that you could prioritize one knowledge and skill category over another. Okay. You know, if I, I could have, uh, uh, wizards in product development, developing products, but if we don't understand the customer (laughs) and what they need, if, if the customer is digital and we're doing analog, you know, 
40 years ago, um, <laughs> we're, we're missing the boat. So we need to understand the, the, the marketplace knowledge, as I've always uh, thought about right. it, is that we are a supplier to potential customers, customers yeah. and prospects, and we have competitors. And there's an environment, an, a regulatory environment, perhaps, that we need to consider. There's a technology evolving environment that we need to consider. So there's many aspects in the marketplace that one could get into. And we need to figure out, well, what, you know, so salespeople need to understand to some level the their features, advantages, yep. and benefits of their products and services. They need to understand the competitors' features and advantages and, and benefits of their products. They need to understand what's happening in the regulatory environment in all of our markets. You know, are there is there are the regulations changing in Europe, but not in you know the U.S. And, and you you know it's you can't generalize and say Europe. You got to go country by country. Now. Uh, but so sometimes, but you need to, the salespeople need to understand that because they th there's some things that it's okay for a salespeople not a salesperson not to know when they're facing a customer, but there's other things that they damn well better know. Otherwise, they embarrass themselves and are not credible in that. So, how do we make our salespeople or so the engine credible that they know who is the number one? competitor you know if okay, it's not good. them who's number two and three you know they need to have that kind yeah, of general okay, understanding I'm, I'm, got it so you cannot yeah okay uh so no, yeah so but so no prioritization but you need to ensure that they have this basic skill like basic uh, knowledge across the board uh, uh across the all the uh, critical categories that you identify and then the topics within that categories and then they need to have the equally spread awareness <laughs> at least awareness. yeah well so it's not yeah. i don't know that it's basic because yeah. sometimes we need to have deep deep yeah yeah yeah, right? yeah 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 so yeah. but yeah so that's we need to look at this yeah you know it's not one category because you need to know a lot of different things to perform you need to yeah. know those what are the expectations of my job uh what are the do's and don'ts yeah. you know of the first yeah. three categories the first three categories there are do's and don'ts yeah right yeah, yeah, uh, yeah even yeah, yeah. industry standards i've had clients who say yeah we're ignoring the industry standards we're going to break the industry standards so those don't apply to us on this product on the other products yeah but on this one here we're going to break the mold we're going to do something so different because we want to revise upgrade the industry standards and you know and so that's got to be a conscious business decision uh usually not by the learners that's a you know the and something that just came to my mind so uh how those 17 categories are listed here is that in the pri in the priority of importance no this is okay. how i start when okay. i start and I've experimented with this. And okay. when I train people, I say, don't change these around because these build on each other. So, got it. you know, if, and, and, and in a highly regulated uh, world, I don't even do category number two because it's covered by number one, our company yeah. policies and procedures and practices and guidelines cover laws, regulations, codes, agreements, and contracts because we're so highly regulated that we've put that in place. So we don't need to say, here's some, here's our company policies guy, and here's the law. No, our company policies should cover what the law requires of our business. And so I could skip category two, but if I'm not sure, I'm going to cover it anyway, because who knows whether the, yeah. the company policies and procedures are complete, et cetera. Um, and, then, and then we're marching through this. So there are... Uh, I, I, I've ex when I train people on doing this, some of these categories at the very end are kind of like uh, I would call them the cow catcher on the front of a train. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we didn't get it in one of the earlier categories, Got it. we hopefully get it in the second. And when people have asked me, well, what if it what if a knowledge and skill item could go in two or three categories? I say capture it once. That's all you need. You do not need to capture you know, something, you know, spreadsheets, you need, you don't need to capture that more than once in this set of matrices because we've got it tied to performance. We'll get it. You could say, well, it's a, it's a tool that we use, 
uh that probably wasn't the best example on this stuff uh but but so the especially the 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 bottom categories here there's management and supervisory yeah. well if we're not dealing with managers then we can skip that category yeah business knowledge and skills professional so if you are a learning professional working in sales in category 16 professional and technical you need to know instructional design or learning yeah. experience design but in yeah. 17 you need to know sales yeah. that's the function you're working yeah, 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 you yeah, move yeah. you from sales to purchasing now you're going to have to learn the purchasing yeah. function in order to serve them and your other peers may not need it because you are the only one serving purchasing they're serving other parts of the business so guy you as an instructional designer need to understand instructional design and you need to understand sales before and now purchasing and so that's how what's needed for your job. So the, that was my kind of cleanup to make it. sure that nothing fell through the cracks um, in terms of what did my target audience need? Now, just because we've identified that they are, these knowledge and skills are needed doesn't mean we're going to develop formal content on them. We could say, oh, we're hiring people into yeah. some of this. Yeah. Um, others, they can learn on the job. I used to call it unstructured OJT. Yeah. That's informal learning, trial yeah. and error, social learning, whatever you want to call those things. Um, and, and so this is just to get that out so we can look at the data and then make decisions about, well, what do we really need to attend to from an instructional standpoint? And I never want to make those decisions as an instructional designer developer type. I want my customer because they live with the consequences of whether we get it right or not. They need to choose where do we spend our time and attention on? What knowledge and skills do we need to get into the workforce? Um, and and how? You know, yeah. and, and so those are those are questions that we collaborate with our clients and stakeholders with in order to come up with uh, the appropriate answer. Okay, so we are five minutes after our time. <laughs> uh so i have one quick question if i may i mean it's not a big question i don't you have quick questions i have long answers <laughs> so you just mentioned the instructor uh on the job so informal learning i know you have a book on social learning that i'm definitely going to read uh do you have i i try to look for i know that you have some articles about you know informal training also on your blog uh, do you have any other book or maybe coming book that will be that or, or resources that you can recommend uh, around the informal informal learning? No, I know I, it's in I, this I, chapter also. I know that it's here and you cover like the yeah. the framework for that. So uh, uh, yeah, but I'm there's just a lot of there's a lot of redundancy between all my writings and, and across my books. I uh, one of my reviewers called it reinforcing rather than redundant. <laughs> but uh, but so yeah the. Social learning is on a spec is on a continuum from extremely informal to somewhat formal social learning, and uh, structured on the job apprenticeships back yeah. in the seventies and eighties were a big deal, and we would have for the mentor or coach no. we would give them a checklist and say cover with guy cover this and this and this and this and this and this and then here's some optional things depending on what guy's job yeah. is cover these things and. And we might even go on further and say, not only cover these things, but test guy. Here are the tests you should give guy. Yeah. Now we're formalizing this social interaction between the coach and a learner or a group of learners. And we're all we're doing is adding, or we could just say, cover spreadsheets with guy and let that go with that. And we, so then we're trusting that the coach will do it adequately for guy yep. or if they don't do it adequately it's not that big a deal the the company won't go bankrupt because guy didn't learn this adequately so based on the risk and rewards at stake you know uh, yep. high stakes performance we're going to do more formal things on that but we can still use social learning social learning is not just informal it can be quite formal. And that was the point of my book. Um, and, and and then it, part of that gets into, um, you know, how do you, the, the rest of the book, a lot of the book gets into what what are the systems you need to put in place to, to do something that's quite formal like this. Now, my company in the past has uh, created systems where people doing very critical work 
could be taught using a social learning means. It wasn't called yeah. that back in the eighties, but that's what it is. And, and, and we can, but we can have control over that. We can, you know, engineer it so that we can check in and make sure that things are happening adequately. Um, and that tends to get very formal, but it's still a form of social learning. It's quite formal and not informal. And I, you know, we we latch onto these things like informal learning to formal learning as if it's not a continuum and a blend. Yeah. You know, that's sometimes it's pure informal, sometimes it's pure formal, but sometimes there's a huge blend that we uh, infuse into the workforce. Okay. So that's that's all. I don't have any other questions. <laughs> well, thank you for reaching so, out. And thank you for agreeing to record this so that we could share this course. with others because others might have similar questions and uh, might help them uh, decide how to adopt or adapt, uh, you know, whatever they might glean from me because that's what I've done from all of my mentors. Yes. Thank you so much. And I'm going to share, I'm going to share the recording with you. Um, so really appreciate you taking your time and I'm definitely uh, going to read all your books <laughs> uh, because, you know, I love the whole approach. So, um, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much and have a good one. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.